Okay, Dad, today is Monday, June 10th, and it seems like a lot happened over the weekend. One of the big things I've been seeing was about these European elections, um, and there's a bunch of hullabaloo. I was watching the news, watching BBC, um, and people were talking about the move to the far right and talking about snap elections in, in France, uh -huh. and it just made me realize that I don't know jack shit about politics in europe i don't understand how the system works so yeah. <laughs> I, I can you kind of explain maybe what's happening is this a big event that uh, you uh, know well yes and no i mean it's this election in itself is not going to have um much of an impact you know very um these were um uh european parliament elections so these are you know the diff various members of the eu um, the various countries that are members of the EU, they 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 elected, held elections, you know, for to send um, representatives to the European Parliament. Um, so it doesn't have an impact on the actually a direct impact on the country um, in which the election was held. Now it doesn't really even have much of an impact at all on EU politics because the European Parliament has very little power. It's really just sort of a, um, an advisory council. That's all it is. Uh, you know, this is one of the things is that you, you, the EU is run by unelected officials like, like uh, Ursula von, von der Leyen. You know, they said the European Commission, you know, there are certain institutions at the top that run it. And these people are not, they're, they're, they're basically bureaucrats appointed by other bureaucrats. And they are not elected, you know, by the people of Europe. They're not elected by the parliament. The parliament just has this was to provide oversight, and um, it does very little of that. Um, now, you know what, what was important about this election is that it indicated, you know, I guess as a lot of those headlines you were mentioning uh, pointed out, a shift to the right, to the populist right, basically. Um, and I think that was probably most dramatic in France, where. Um, Marine Le Pen's party, you know, the national rally got 30% of the vote and Macron's only got 15%. So she, so she just absolutely, you know, crushed them two to one. But, and that, but, was so, a, that was a significant well, shift from, you know, well, a few years ago. But, but what does that mean? You're saying that, you know, the, the, in Brussels, they're, they're not elected bureaucrats. They are just installed bureaucrats, deep states of right. democracy. And then, so what is this that they're being elected for? What was well, this election the all about? Parliament, okay. Which, which you is, said is just an advisory council? Yeah, the, right, right. And they don't have, they can't actually legislate. So it's not like you think about a, a parliament, you know, you think you're thinking about a legislature. Okay, these people have the power of the purse or whatever, you know, like it would be the case with the U.S. Congress or with, you know, various parliaments within European countries. But no, they don't really have any power. Um, now, you know, they can... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they have a megaphone as something as a place where they can speak out and, and you know, at least have their opinion heard. Um, and, you know, I, I think they can, you know, occasionally, like at least, well, the advisory, you know, oversight, they can draw attention to issues, you know, they can, but but that's about it. Um, and, and the problem is, another problem, in addition to the problems that I mentioned earlier, is that the representatives, when they get sent to Brussels, tend to just um, tend to join the club because Brussels is, with the exception of, you know, Belgian re representatives, is in another country that's far away from home. They lose contact with, you know, the, the people that elected them and tend to just become part of this huge bureaucracy that exists in Brussels. I mean, that's a problem that, that happens within countries, like within the U.S., you know, mm. uh, Somebody is elected to the House of Representatives, you know, he goes off, off there, you know, claiming that he's going to clean, clean the house, drain the swamp, whatever. And when he gets there, he ends up, you know, just kind of uh, joining the system, you know, rather than being an enemy of the system. Yeah. But that's just mm -hmm. doubly true in the case of Brussels, because the bureaucracy is so huge and it's so distant from and from, um, you know, the, the local district from which this person is rep uh, elected. 
So, uh, you know, we you can't really expect much to happen, I think, as a result of this in within Brussels. But it does show that within these different countries, you know, we're seeing an obvious trend towards the populist right. And we saw it in France, Germany and Italy. Well, if there's not, if it doesn't really matter that much, then why is Macron calling for uh, an election? I mean, well, what, I what think is it that? Is, again, it's because it just the it does indicate that there is a shift that scares him. And I you know, there's it's not clear why he's doing that, but he seems to think that um, that if he strikes now, uh, he can, um, you know, maybe the opposition is only going to grow stronger over time, that he actually has a better shot at uh, taking them on now. Uh, I but don't if know, he that, lost that, by, you know, yeah, double right. of Marine Le Pen, it seems like, <laughs> ooh, this is not a good time, right? Yeah, surely yeah gonna it's, lose. Not, it's not clear to me what he's doing, but I, you know, that's, you know, why is... Rishi Sunak calling a snap election. I think it's just maybe that they, they figure that things are going to be even worse down the road. They have actually maybe, a better shot. Do you think the maybe they, they just the... want out and they're like, maybe this is the way to... <laughs> well, that's know, the rumor right? about Macron, that he actually just wants out. Yeah, you know, maybe... He, uh... <laughs> but <laughs> you he... think these people, once they're in power, you know, they always say they never want to let go. So it's kind yeah, of hard to right. believe. Yeah, well, they say about Macron that he really wants to be emperor of the universe or at least of Europe or something. So... <laughs> So, so the idea is then, so there will be an election, and uh, is this a presidential election that will be called in France? Uh, that... No, I think the president, no, it's just a parliamentary election. Uh, the okay. presidential election is going to be held in 2027, so it's quite a few years, um, you know, in France. But he could, potentially, he actually could call a presidential election earlier. He just hasn't done that. Okay, so is this a big but, deal? You are just kind of it just it just seems from what you're saying it don't right. sounds like it's kind of a sort of getting the barometric pressure in Europe seeing which way the winds are blowing yeah yeah and yeah, we're... yeah right um, well you know in France if we're going to have these parliamentary elections it looks like uh, Marine Le Pen's party is poised to do quite well um, and uh, you know again Macron's part party is going to do very poorly so that will. That's got to make a difference. You know, this is actual real parliament we're talking about. Mm -hmm. a, um, a, yeah, I guess it's the National Assembly that we're talking about in France. Well, I mean, Marine Le Pen, she's uh, she's and, more of an anti-war candidate. She doesn't want to support right. the war in Ukraine. That's what we're seeing happening in Germany as well. It seems like right. democracy is kind of working in the sense right. that the people are finally getting their voice heard and saying enough is enough. So well, what again, is this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, actually that Ukraine was probably not a, you know, was not an insignificant issue in this election. And it was something that definitely hurt the establishment. I saw a poll that came out just a few days ago that showed in in Europe, 88% of the population, let, let me get this right here, okay, believe that NATO member countries should push for a negotiated settlement for the war in Ukraine. And then the mm -hmm. number of the percentage of of uh, respondents who said that you know that the U.S. should try to, uh, or not the U.S. but NATO should try to regain all last territories. That should be their main objective, or or actually to uh, cause regime change in Russia. It was just very small. It was a tiny mm -hmm. minority. But of course, you know, among elites, that's what they're talking about. Uh, so it's just it shows how much out of step the lead opinion is with popular opinion. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons that we saw the shift to the populist right, because in general, it's uh, in most countries, it's the populist right that's that espouses, you know, the, uh, you know, the anti-Ukraine. In other words, let's disengage from Ukraine to varying degrees. So, you know, uh, Marine Le Pen says, OK, well, we could sell defensive weapons, but none of this stuff, you know, no weapons that are going to go into Russian territory. And let's let's push for a negotiated solution. Mm -hmm. So it's not a radical, you know, like a pro they, she's always described as pro-Russian or something or Putin's puppet, of course. But right. um, it's just it's actually a very moderate position, but uh, one that I think is much closer to the, the way the the population in France thinks. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the two kind of most hawkish countries, pro-Ukraine countries in Europe, you can argue would be France and the UK, and both of them are now having snap elections. Right. Um, so yeah, but, it, do you think that's largely because of that Ukraine support? Uh, in and the case then, of France, I think you could say, I think it is a, a, a major, a very important factor, you know, in explaining the 
the recent recent election election outcome and therefore you know the snap election uh, but in Britain no unfortunately um, there really isn't an alternative in Britain I mean it's it's basically you know labor and the conservatives and there's there's not in uh, you know a hair's breadth worth of difference between them on you it's know, like the US policy. the uniparty huh yeah right it's the uniparty there too okay um, well, I, so uh, how, how is uh, Zelensky, you think, taking all this? He's got to be shaking in his boots a bit more if France was <laughs> the one that was kind of pushing for NATO troops. And yeah. now yeah, you're no, seeing it being flipped it around. It has to be another blow against, yeah, because, right, Macron was one of his biggest supporters. And mm -hmm. uh, Macron's still and yeah, there, but, but, I mean, his position doesn't look as secure as it once was. Just so let's say that. So, right, yeah, and I've also been seeing some headlines that in the West even kind of saying that, oh, questioning the legitimacy of Zelensky, saying that he doesn't, he's not really the one in charge. Um, I don't uh -huh. know if you've seen any of these headlines. Yeah. Um, but I... it sounds like it's cracking more. So I don't know if you have anything to throw in there, any updates that yeah. you've heard. Well, I think, you know, in general, it seems like the establishment is still solidly behind them. But but there are dissenting voices, I think, even within the establishment on that. And that's why we get these these, you know, leaks and these discussions in the, the mainstream press. Um, yeah, I think you're referring to the kind of the uh, the power behind the throne. The, uh, is Yermak, I think is his name. Um, he was a, a film producer. So he was in the <laughs> entertainment industry in Ukraine, you know, just like uh, Zelensky was. And uh, he's been yeah, kind of his sponsor. He's always been kind of his, yeah, you know, lurking in the background. Um, but now I think increasingly he's kind of stepped out of the shadows. Uh, it, generally, that's where he likes to stay. But you know, he's I've made some appearances in recent tri trips um, to foreign countries, and um, and there are complaints that are coming from Ukraine and being reported in the West that he actually has more power than Zelensky. You know that the, the man is is very ambitious and is. Uh, um, yeah, you know, maybe eventually is, is, is Zelensky is, may turn into a puppet, you know, not just a puppet of the United States, but the puppet, a puppet of your neck. The double puppet. Okay. Interesting. Um, well, seeing how we're talking about politicians and, um, elections and all these changes, maybe we can talk a little bit about, uh, Benny Gantz resigning and the significance of that. Um, so Benny Gantz was the. Minister of Defense of Israel. He was he was the one uh, that was um, labeled by the ICC along with uh, Netanyahu um, as uh, putting out an arrest for war crimes. Um, now he's resigned, and from my gathering, it's because he's not happy with the way Netanyahu's handled Hamas. What what does this mean for Netanyahu um, and the future of Israel? Uh, Who do you think will replace him? Do you think someone like Ben Gavir, which is even more dangerous, um, would t would take over the position? Well, let's see, just a second. Hang on, just okay. Um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, it's fine. No, look at something. Well, I, um, I don't know what have I done here. <laughs> what have I done? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, anyway, um, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. You know, first of all, he he uh, resigned from the War Cabinet, which is kind of an informal group, and it's not part of of um, of Netanyahu's governing coalition. So this doesn't threat, threaten uh, Netanyahu's power directly. Um, um, and then, you know, what it means for, it's not actually clear that, you know, first of all, Gantz was often put out as kind of a, a rival, right, to Netanyahu as a potential replacement for him. And I think he's still spoken of in that way. Um, but substantively, there's not a bit of difference between them, you know, especially, you know, at least not when it comes to Gaza. I mean, the, the, the differences are entirely superficial. Um, that's something that's not very well understood in the West. It's just, or, you know, within like the, U, the, the U.S., uh, the Biden administration had him over a few months ago. The idea was to try to boost, you know, give him a boost relative to Netanyahu in the hopes that he could replace Netanyahu. And, and said, well, you, I think even when Gantz was there, he even just made it clear, you, you know, you, whether you have me or you have Netanyahu, you know, it, was, it doesn't make a difference as far as Gaza goes. Um, and, 
this his uh, decision to resign. I mean, you could look at it as a, maybe he's potentially going to put him, you know, uh, begin to campaign against him. It, it may be a move in preparation for some sort of uh, um, um, a beginning of a rival, a more open rivalry between the two of them. That may be the case, but um, it seems like his star has fallen, you know, over the last several weeks. In fact, that at one point, the Gantz may have been equally popular or more popular than Netanyahu, but that's just not true now. Yet Netanyahu is actually uh, uh, pulling ahead in the opinion polls. I mean, they, they Why? Both get a lot of negatives, but it's not that Netanyahu is particularly popular, but Gantz is even less popular. Well, is there somebody else in the wing? I mean, the, because to re- I don't, to I don't replace them in the war cabinet, or or just well, to replace Netanyahu, or period. just just saying, just a more popular, you know, candidate. Yeah, well, because it's, there's it's been protests in right. in Israel for a long time. Right, clearly like people Gantz unhappy. Was, right, yeah, Gantz was probably the lead, it probably still is the leading rival to Netanyahu. Um, but I think Netanyahu it looks it still has the upper hand if it, if it comes you know into a, a, a direct well conflict or election you know uh, um, if an election is held and they're they're the two leading candidates I think Netanyahu would be likely to win. But there's mm-hmm. no reason that an election would be held because again his Netanyahu's uh, ruling coalition is not threatened by this resignation. Okay, well, seeing how we're talking about Israel, I think we can stay here for a second um, and talk a little bit about this uh, hostage uh, rescue operation that happened the other day. Um, I was watching the news and the news was, you know, Fox News and MSNBC talking about this heroic effort uh, done by the IDF um, and how they saved these four hostages from these horrible conditions. But I think many of us are pretty appalled at what happened. Um, from my understanding, over 270 people were killed, mostly women and children, um, obliterated, that the IDF came hidden in an aid food truck. So people came running to the truck for supplies, medical supplies and food, and they just jumped out and started blasting everybody. Um, and then there's also rumors about uh, the U.S. Special Forces being involved, and this humanitarian pier was kind of a, a little jumping-off point for this uh, operation. Um, I don't know if you've heard any of these rumors okay, or have I, anything to add. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard the rumors. You know, I was just checking in on that the rumor about the pier, and as far as I can tell, that did not happen. You know, mm. maybe let's, it's still all very recent and whatever, but. It, but there hasn't been any, I haven't seen any solid evidence. Um, I would and, think that they want to trust the pier. It's to yeah, fall apart right. to try to launch <laughs> well, an you know, operation. As far as, as far as I knew, it wasn't there. It had been towed off to some, you know, to the harbor. And that yeah, I'm surprised that it would be back there and actually in working order. Or maybe there's pieces of it used. that they could use it for a <laughs> helicopter. I don't know. Yeah, but, so. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think it's even functional at this point. You know, they they just started, a few trucks got off the pier, you know, before the whole thing broke up, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, but I don't think it was supposed to be ready by this point. It, I don't, it's probably still going under repairs, or maybe they're just in the process of reinstalling it. So I don't think that happened. I think, um, but wait, wait, hold what do you say really about quick. the appalling loss of life? Um, yeah, there's no question about that. Um yeah, I th- I think you know ac- according to uh, the Hamas government or the you know, the Gazan authorities, those two hundred and seventy four people were killed um, to rescue four Israeli we're, hostages. We're, weren't four hostages also killed by them? So they killed. Yeah, or so, I think I heard, I've that heard three were, but you know, you know when I, I I haven't been able to confirm that. You know, again, that's mm. rumor. I don't. I heard uh, I heard something about an American hostage being killed. You know, by the, uh-huh. which you know, yeah. I mean it's. We'll just have to see that's just... been confirmed at this point. Four were rescued. There's no question about that. And then 274, you know, according to the Gazans, were killed. The Israelis said, oh, it's not that much. It was under 100. I think when the Israelis say under 100, it's probably like 274, to be honest. And, and mm. what the fact is, like, you know, the photographs, the, the video footage that's come out just seems to yeah, yeah, support um, – mass carnage, mass destruction. Um, and, it, you know, the, apparently, like, the, these these hostages were in an apartment building close to this refugee camp. Um, and, you know, yeah, the, uh, 
the Israeli soldiers, you know, were disguised, I think, as as local Gazans. And you, I, I, yeah, I also heard that they came out of a a relief truck. Um, you know, I've heard that at least from a couple different sources. I'm, I'm not; it's not completely confirmed in my mind, but but that's probably what happened. Anyway, they were disguised. They entered this building. They they rescued these hostages, but in the process of rescuing them, or you know, is it, it seems massively, you know, excessive, but they actually just totally destroyed the the apartment buildings on both sides of the apartment building in which the hostages were. So those are just piles of rubble now, and everybody that was in them, you know, they're, they're all dead. Um, and coming out, yeah, they just, you know, they just blew up everybody. It was not just, you know, gunfire, you know, of course, well, of course, you know, the the, the buildings were taken down by, um, I think, by uh, uh, air-to-surface rockets. Um, um, yeah, you know, I've never seen anything like that. I've, I, I can remember different hostage, you know, rescue operations over the years, including a very brave Israeli one at the Entebbe Airport in Uganda, um, which was back around 1980 or so. Uh, but there was, you know, there are. I don't know if any civilians were killed in that, you know, or if they did, then the numbers were very few. I mean, this is just something that on a, I've, I've never seen before. It, it so seems like you'd have to go. In order to, I think it was almost, it's hard to believe that it was any, you know, clearly they, they weren't concerned about the lives of these people, but it almost seems like it didn't even, it was unnecessary. You know, maybe I'm wrong. They had there was some I, sort of military objective involved in destroying the, 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 the how the apartment buildings on both sides, but that just seems so thoroughly excessive that, and the that I think it was just, you know, it's just typical, it's just reflective of this whole campaign. It's just genocidal. I mean, it was just say, okay, combine uh, a hostage rescue with you know uh, more mass casualties just to teach them a further lesson and you know prepare the way for the eventual total ethnic cleansing Gaza. Right. I mean, I was going to say that it seems like they, they really must have gone out of their way to get kill that many, innocent, you know, civilians. I mean, right. two, over 200 and, you know, we'll see the exact number, but we're hearing 274 is what I heard and something like 500 severely injured. Um, right. Like that's a big number. And, to, and it just it's it's, you know, it reminds me of did you ever see Team America with uh, the guys that created South Park? It, it's uh... I, I probably have a, a well, time well it ago. starts <laughs> yeah, it starts <laughs> off with them trying to capture a bad guy, maybe some terror sets in France, and Team America comes in, they blow up the Eiffel Tower and Versailles and everything you know, like in the yeah. process, and then at the end, they're all high fiving each other, like we did it, we saved the day, you know yeah. right. that, that's what this feels like, you know because I'm seeing on the news and Fox News like all oh, these they're heroes, look what they did. It's like you guys just massacred hundreds of women and children, you know, right. body parts strewn on the streets. Right. How can we right. be celebrating this? This is a war crime. Um, and it I, it sounds like that the U.S. was involved in some extent, at least There's, through intelligence. Yeah, rumors, yeah. And, and, and I've been hearing rumors about even U.S. Special Forces being involved. Have you heard anything about that? That I haven't heard. I just heard that they may be, yeah, that... Okay, we'll put a pin in that and I'll make any... Yeah, yeah I, I'm just wondering what, when this all shakes out, you know, in the hor in the horrible way it is, that if we will, if there will be any accountability for American leaders, um, if we will see, uh, you know, war crimes being charges being uh, pressed against uh, our, our own politicians, do you think that would ever be possible? Because no. it's clear <laughs> that we are involved in this. Yeah. I mean. Right. I mean, only after the revolution, if there ever is one, and I don't think there will. Well, not in my lifetime, I don't think. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's just, any, it's just so yeah. crazy this this hostage situation, and just it, it made makes me sick when I hear just see people on the news just talking yeah. about yes, we did it, how brave right. they were, and we saved these people. Right. Look, I'm well, happy I, the I, hostages are re are out and returned, but you killed hundreds of innocent people. Doing right. it, that's not a right. victory. We can't right. celebrate you know, you this. It's a, yeah. a win. You have maybe three, a few happy families in Israel, and I understand why they're happy. Um, but you now you have an additional, you know, hundred, hundreds of grieving families in Gaza. And unless you just think that, you know, that 
these people's lives are somehow, you know, are worth a lot more than the, the other people's lives, you know, you, you, you can't say this was a good outcome. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, okay. I, I think I want to try to pivot a little bit, um, from Israel, unless you have anything else you want to add. Um, no, I don't think so. any, yeah. any news about uh, a Lebanon invasion. We're still just kind of waiting. No, it's still, oh, oh, well, actually maybe I will add a little bit because, um, it's, it's, um, you know, apparently there has been a lot of exchange of, of uh, uh, you know, rockets and missiles across the border. And um, th these haven't been random attacks. You know, it has, Hezbollah has been going at this very systematically. They've been simply just uh, destroying, you know, one monitoring post after another, you know, first very close to the border. And they, I think they managed to do that in the first couple of months. Uh, and then they started going deeper. Recently, they've made strikes. Actually, they hit um, an Israeli air base to the south of Haifa. That's about, mm -hmm. you know, 30 miles from the border, south of the border. And then they also hit one around Nazareth. Okay, that's about the same distance. Um, and then, yeah, and around this, yeah, just a few days ago, they actually uh, struck and apparently destroyed an Iron Dome um, system. I Again, saw that so on, from... yeah, I saw an X, but I wasn't sure if it was verified. Yeah, no, I've, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen that elsewhere. Um, but, you know, what I've, what I've heard is that they pretty much, you know, that, that, that the Israelis now are um, at a great disadvantage, or they simply, they don't have the, the, the facilities, the surveillance capabilities that they had at this, you know, on October 7th. That Hezbollah has just, has simply eliminated them, you know, close to the northern border, and that just means that it's going to be much more difficult for the Israelis to go in. Um, now they're still making noises about it. Um, they've made noises about it in the past, you know, about launching an a, an attack on or an invasion into Lebanon. It's just that it became the rhetoric came very heated a few days ago. Um, and you know more so than in the past and there was the, uh, you know so you had generals saying that we've got it's time for war we're doing it now and and we're still waiting you know maybe it'll happen you know who knows what the, what kind of discussions are taking place you know in the yeah uh, behind the scenes uh we'll just have to walk okay. but you know it's it's uh it's just interesting again hezbollah is not hamas hezbollah can, hamas can can do damage you know you, know, you can get the occasional tank or, you know, or Israeli soldier, even an Israeli platoon or something. But uh, but Hezbollah can do a lot more. It can do damage and has done serious damage to Israeli military infrastructure. OK, well, well, it all sounds pretty scary for the Israelis. We'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, I wanted to go back sort of to the U.S. domestically here. You know, we, we both watched that. Uh, uh, Tucker Carlson interview with Thomas Massey. Um, Thomas Massey is now the coolest guy that I know of after watching that interview. Um, but uh, he said some really crazy things that I just wanted to, to you know, explore with you. Um, and one was just him talking about how everybody in Congress, except for Thomas Massey on the Republican side, has an APAC guy. And he he talked about how the Israeli lobby works, how when you're running for Congress, you're just for local politics, that, you know, APAC will basically come to you and ask you to write a little something about Israel, a little white paper, and they're conditioning you, and then they'll give you some money, and they'll just, that's the first sort of step in the door, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, they're giving you money, and they've already conditioned you to be like, they've done a little something for me already, and now I'm doing more. I thought it was very interesting to sort of explore just how our Congress works and how how clicky it is. Sometimes we think about these politicians, these leaders, that somehow they're above normal human beings, that they have some type of powers and capabilities and intellect that us normies don't possess. But you realize that they're just very flawed people, just like you and I, and maybe even more so because as politicians, they're all about wanting to be liked. And being liked can sometimes make you lose your course and uh, your, your morals. Um, but him just saying that everybody has an APAC guy, I, I think it is, it is insane. And I, I'm wondering, has there ever been this kind of level of exposure of 
the Israeli influence in our government before? Or is this, are we in a new realm where all of a sudden, you know, the, the veil, the curtain's been drawn back and we can see, you know, Dr. Oz behind there pulling cranks and levers. Um, yeah. Is that kind of where we're at or? Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, for people who paid attention, you know, this was known going back decades. Um, you know, I think, a, you know, one thing that's different is, again, that, well, Tucker Carlson, again, is he, he was the single most had the single most popular show on Fox News. And it was a show that it was watched by conservatives. Right. In in general. And I think not entirely, probably, but but in general. Um, and, yeah, he's drawing the veil, you know, and 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 showing it to us. So it's, yeah, it's encouraging that this is happening. Um, it's encouraging that the one guy who didn't have an APAC guy, in, in other words, Thomas Mas, Masi, you know, he was, um, he was told, like all these other people, you said, yeah, well, you could write this paper, and, you know, it's like, a, he called it a term paper. And he said, I'm not doing this. Why should I do this? You know, this is, I don't like writing papers. So he, he never cooperated from the start. He never took that first step. Um, but, and then, you know, he, he's recently, you know, has been quite open about uh, his opposition to the, you know, these various efforts now to provide unconditional support to Israel. You know, he's, he's stood resolutely against it. He says recently what there have been, um, what, just in the last month, there were 14 votes on Israel. Um, or even more, I think he said 18. Okay, 18, yeah. More than, or 18, you know, okay. Yeah, yeah, but it was more than... More votes on America. Uh, You're right, Yeah, exactly. more votes on Israel than there are about America right. from, by right. our Congress. Right. Isn't that right. crazy? Right, and he voted yeah. against every single one of them. Every single one mm -hmm. of them. Um, uh, recently, there was a primary in, you know, that he, in his district. Um, and APAC poured a lot of money into it. I think it was $700,000. And which is a lot for it's a small district, a rather poor district. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of money himself. You know, he's not he doesn't he's he's not the kind of guy that lobbyists like and support because he never uh, supports their pet pet projects. Um, but it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. But he ended up winning with seventy percent of them. It wasn't even close. Um, and what that I find very encouraging. You know, just the fact that okay, this is a a uh, conservative rural district in Kentucky. Um, and, you know, APEC uh, pointed some of its big guns there. And in general, you know, it's just the, the, uh, the, the establishment press, including the conservative established press, is, is, has made him out to be an enemy. Um, but it didn't make a difference to those people. And uh, that just reminds me of what happened with, it was uh, Walter Jones in North Carolina or Ron Paul in Texas. You know, again, they were they represented very conservative districts, and they were, um, you could say, they had the most radical anti-war uh, foreign policies of anybody, uh, just about anybody in the Congress. And they were representing these conservative districts. And you know, again, the neocons went after Walter Jones, and they went after Ron Paul again and again, and never made any difference. It's like the local people said, you know, this guy is good, I and we support him. Um, and it just what it tells me is that. Yeah, the 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 elite is corrupt, um, but yeah, what what it is is it, you know these these foreign policy positions, and I think we're seeing the same thing in Europe. Um, these are elite obsessions. There's, there's they have virtually no grassroots support. It's not that the people are asking for this and the politicians are responding. And sometimes you know you'll get you can get. Um, uh, opinion polls that maybe will show that a, a majority of people, you know, s support um, um, support Ukraine or are in favor of sending more weapons or whatever. But I think that is actually just very shallow. It's they're just responding to what they see on TV. It's not something that they are asking for. It's just that they are reflecting to a certain extent elite opinion. But when you have somebody brave like Thomas Massey or Ron Paul um, or Walter Jones, you know, you um, the people listen, and they're very easily persuaded that no, we don't need to send weapons to these places. No, we don't need to get involved in these wars. I mean, the 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 devotion to these these various conflicts is is not coming from the people. It's, it, it was it's, again, it's an elite obsession, um, and 
I, I you know, I think that's that gives us reason to hope. Yeah, my, my hope is that you know the fact that he won his district despite APAC pulling out all the stops and kept running some real nasty ads, you know, against him. Um, he still won, I think, with seventy six percent, yeah, um, resoundingly. Um, so I, I hope that other politicians will take a look and see, you know, right. like, hey, like the, the the power they they don't have this that power over you that you think they do. You know, right. they, you're scared of it, but, you know, you break the trend. I think a lot of people see this, you know, like if they get canned from their mainstream media job of like, you know, Tucker Carlson and you you or, or, or whatever, you find that actually it can be liberating. You know, Candace Owens with Daily Wire or whatever, that now they're truly free and they can, uh, um, you know, they, that, that that's actually very appealing to people. People like that. You know, people don't like people are aware now that. There's handlers behind all these institutions that somebody's running and it doesn't feel right. And now you just have somebody that's honest, that's not beholden to anybody. And that resonates with people. Um, so hopefully we'll see more politicians having the, the bravery to, uh, you know, to stand up. Uh, another thing that I like about Thomas Massey is that, you know, he's just very principled that he will work with AOC on certain things or Bernie Sanders. You know, it's like right. he's not just like, oh, I, this is I'm with the Republicans. I have to vote everything that they do or, I'm, you know, whatever. This this tribal politics. It's just it's the way this country is supposed to work. You're supposed uh -huh. to have somebody from your your a congressman from your district to talk about the problems in your district and, you know, go and represent you in D.C. It seems like Massey is the only one that does that. Everybody else immediately, all of a sudden, you're working for Big Pharma, you're working for the Israeli lobby, you're, you're working for the military industrial complex, um, and that's what happens to everybody. Um, but we're uh -huh. seeing if you do, you know, swim against the current, you know, like Massey, it, you will be rewarded by the people. Is the people right. respect yeah. that? Um, not yeah. really a question right. there, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Um, yeah, and you hope that that's going to have an impact. But then, you know, you can point out that Ron Paul was there, kind of a was a lone voice. He was often the single dissenting, you know, voice or, or one of a very, well, very few for decades. And <laughs> he, he well, had I think it's a different Right. It's a right. different time, though. Now, I mean, yeah. Ron Paul was just a little bit too early. Social media wasn't what it used to be. Uh -huh. Podcasting wasn't what it used to be. Um, and also just Israel isn't what it used to be exactly. I mean, what, what we're right. seeing now happening in Gaza and the exposure of APAC um, and the Israeli lobby, I think it's I think the awareness of Israeli influence in our government has never been so pro prominent yeah. in, in, in our society right. than oh, now. Right. right. Would you say right. that? Uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that that's, that's a yeah, big problem for to... Israel. That's right. You know, is. That's right. And the, yeah. this is what it is. Then they start freaking out about it. And then it right. becomes even more obvious. Right. It's like, right. oh, right. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. why, why is why is a foreign country yeah. paying all of our politicians right. off and making right. well, our again, politicians how many, do homework? I don't know how many people watch that interview? How many millions of people? I think I, it was I, like six million last I checked. You right. Know? And a yeah, good thing is probably a lot of those people are Republicans. Um, and actually, one thing that he pointed out was that at first he was like the only guy on the Republican side. But now there there are more. There are others that are joining him in these anti-Israel vo votes. Mm -hmm. It used to be that he was the sole, you know, Republican that was vo voting against Israel. And I think it's now some, maybe it's 20 or something like that, which is we still got a long ways to go. But that's something, you know, you have yeah, to start no. somewhere. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's good to see it breaking on the right because we talked about this a couple months before that, yeah. you know, sympathy towards the Palestinians usually came from the left only and the people on the right, right. you know, were, right. um, which was uh, unfortunate. Yeah. But now we're seeing, you know, people like Thomas Massey be able to eloquently state like, this is not in the benefit of the United States or you, you know, this doesn't protect our security. It actually right. harms it, um, you know, it's able to really expose. It's just like, it's, it's just wrong to have, a foreign government, you know, uh, and a lobby for a foreign government that is just so embedded in our politics. And mm -hmm. and every single every single congressman has an APAC guy that they talk to regular. And like you say, nobody's got a British guy or a German <laughs> guy or, you know, a yeah, Canada I guy. I think it was Tucker Carlson and, that said that, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, well, he was saying that nobody has that. Yeah. He was saying, like, asking, like, yeah. well, do you, what yeah. about, you know, do you how many Putin yeah. guys are, right. are, you know, do, you, do they have? Yeah, right, right. We, we yeah, make yeah, the all claim the talk that, about Russian interference. And there's, right, Russian interference got in our election. Yeah, nobody has a Russian guy. It's always yeah, it's, it's just like, guy. this is 
the, the most it's completely obvious. out in the open, really. I mean, yeah, really. it's right. We did this <laughs> so, Russian gate yeah, hoax forever. Yeah. It's like, did anybody never, look yeah, that ch- <laughs> right? Basically, chasing shadows. There was nothing there, but here, Did this you, is just yeah, completely out. I wonder of the if open. APAC was just right. kind of in the background. It's like, ah, yes, you know, Russia. This don't look this way, or they yeah. don't even care. I think they they know. Yeah. Like, yeah, we we got the U.S. by the balls. They'll do whatever we want them yeah. to do. Right. Well, um, it comes out. It actually, it's a it's a reflection of their power and the the and how much people fear them. I mean, that is essentially do not point at us. You know, that's the instructions. Okay, we are the eternal victims. You know, we are, um, and never you forget that. And it's and they all answer yes, sir. You know, <laughs> you stop and think about this. Well, wait a second. If they're really that weak, you know, how can they? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they can get all these people to line up behind them, follow their their instructions. Do, do you yeah. think that you know basically we are seeing the end, hopefully, of APAC? That there's any turning around for this? Do you think they'll yeah. be able to reassert their dominance and control? Well, or they now still, that they've been exposed, yeah. um, I think it's the beginning of the end. You know, that's uh, um, I certainly have a lot more hope for the like the end of APAC and the end of uh, of uh, Zionist dominance over. Uh, the United States politics, a lot more hope than I had, well, you know, before October 7th, basically. How um, long of a process do you think this, I mean, the big question is like, will will Israel use its nukes before it all ends? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a whole other question, but it's just, but, you know, even if they do, I think that could be the end, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just that that's the... Will they go out with the big like, thing? Like, yeah, yeah, in that mushroom cloud, you know, well, you know, how many people die? You don't even want to think about it. But it could also that mushroom cloud could just mark the end of of Zionist dominance of the United States, you know, because that that would be like that would destroy the last illusions that some people have. I mean, people mm-hmm. that who would continue to support Israel would just be, I hope anyway, maybe I, I'm being, um, you know, putting too much faith in the sanity of people, but I. I hope, like the the diehards that would continue to support them, would just be universally regarded as as crazies and pushed mm-hmm. off to the the sides. I, I know we've done a couple episodes before talking about like the history of Israel, but just can you can we talk about it real quick recap again? Just like who, who really created Israel? I mean, it was created in 1948. You know, after war, the aftermath of World War II, was it something that really just the U.S. and Britain and France got together and just said, "Okay, here you go"? I mean, right. well, there was a U.N. resolution. I think it was in 1947 um, that split the land of Palestine into roughly into two halves. They actually, they really gave more to Israel. It's supposed to be divided between, roughly, between uh, you know the Arab population and the Jewish population. How does the uh, UN have the authority to do that? Can they just go into another country and just cut it up? Like how? Well, yeah. I mean that that's a good question. I mean they it, it was because um, the UN you know doesn't have its own army. It had a moral authority. You know that's let's just say it that. But in the end, the real fighting was done by by Israeli you know Jewish militias, um, and. Uh, and what they did is, yeah, they took that that time. It was it it was a statement, let's say, of nothing else but of international support. They had, you know, there was international support for the creation of a state of Israel. And was it because upon that. was it just, it just the Holocaust was really yeah, what right. fueled it's it? Just like you know, the persecution of Jews and the great suffering of Jews, as you know, during World War II, um, just uh, won the sympathy of of many people, particularly in the West. Um, and that's what made this possible. Um, well, there, I mean, that's partly what it made it possible there, you know, there was a push for the push going all the way back to the, the, the uh, birth of the Zionist movement in the 19th century, uh, Theodore Hertz, Theodore right? Hertz yeah. right. And then what we had actually like a British intention to create a homeland for Jews in Palestine, going back to the early part of the 20th century, the Balfour Declaration. Declaration, which was roughly what 1918, something like that, around the end of the World War One. Um, so there was there were already forces in play, um, and 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 uh, Jewish migration to Palestine had already begun, and there were already you know incidents, clashes of you know there were already settlers in 
in Palestine, like during the 20s and 30s. Um, and it was just, it was World War II, the, the, the outcome of World War II that just gave it a big boost. There was, again, you know, sympathy on the international front. And then there were a lot of uh, Jewish refugees that, that were uh, taken by ship to Israel and, you know, it were, um, um, you know, greatly boosted the population there. Um, so, you know, again, this was, you know, it has to point, be pointed out that whatever happened in Europe, the, the Palestinian people, the Arabs who lived there had nothing to do with that one way right, or another. Right. 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 Um, like, take it out of Germany, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And it's, I, you know, we can go, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, they, they, the, the Jewish militias, you know, launched these attacks and a lot of them, you know, in some cases they, you know, they, it was, uh, just a matter of, you know, driving people out of towns, um, and the various yeah, villages I... out in the, in some cases they committed massacres. Like there you seem, I think 200 <laughs> civilians were killed in that village, it, but mm -hmm. that was all part of the same program you know we'll do a massacre here a massacre there and you know the news will get out and they'll start running in terror and that's and that indeed is what happened and some of them fled you know those who were in the south fled into what is now gaza i mean just virtually everybody in gaza is um either a refugee from that time or a, you know the child the Sunday, grandchild yeah. of a refugee from that time um, so they're all now they're doubly and triply refugees. You know, they've been driven from the homes that they had in Gaza into other parts of Gaza, and it, it just never ends for them. That's part of, you know, it's a horror upon horror for them. Um, and yeah, and the West Bank, uh, that's the, many of them ended up what's now called the West Bank, but others were driven directly into Lebanon and, and there were refugee camps there in Jordan. More than 50% of the population of Jordan is actually Palestinians, people mm -hmm. that were driven off the, off the land. In, you know, yeah, I remember it, Israel. Yeah, when I was in Jordan, I felt like everybody was Palestinian. You know, every taxi yeah. driver is yeah, in that's Jordan is going to be Palestinian. Too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, I'm just more, more curious about under what authority was the state of Israel created? Like, I didn't know that the UN could say, like, okay, we're going to create a state, and then it, it gave it that authority. Right. Um, now, you know, the, the Israelis, the, okay, they drew these boundaries. Now, the Israelis did not respect those boundaries. They, now, I should say the Jews, because this was even, like, before the creation. These Jewish militias, they did not respect. They, it was roughly 50%, even though more than half the population was Arab. So even then, it wasn't really fair. Um, you know, the Arabs didn't see this as fair. And this is, we get, wait a second, this is our land. Now you're just going to yeah. give it, you know, you're going right, to give it to who, another who gets, people. Who gets to say? Um, the UN just then, could come in and draw? Right. They just draw a line right. on a map and say the people right. living there and have they, to abide right. by it? And there was no license to drive the people off the land either. You know, say, okay, this you'll have this land. But, they, you know, they drove, drew the line. So let's say within this area, the majority would be Jewish. And the other area, they'd be almost entirely Arabs. And, you know, and you were supposed to accept that, well, people who are living here already, you're going to have to accept them as part of your new country. Um, and it may have been like 30, 30, 40 percent of uh, the people within the, the you know, the, the uh, declared state of Israel were Arabs. But the, I think it's clear that the, the Jews back at that time decided we're not, you know, we're not going to let that many Arabs yeah, we're going to try to get as many of them out of here as possible. Um, you know, an interesting kind of, uh, it's a little bit of a tangent, but not much. The, the Nazareth was, Nazareth, you know, this was the city um, where Jesus lived most of his life, um, where he was a carpenter, is or was, you know, and I think to a fair extent still is, a, a Christian city. It was Arab Christians, Palestinian Christians, and... Um, but the, it, it, the the militias actually were drove the attempted to drive the residents out of at Nazareth, just as they were, you know, driving them out of all these other towns and small cities, and you know, in to the to the west, or rather to the east. Um, but the they realized, that, you know, there was some there was some uh, message came from a, a um, type. You guys don't do this to Nazareth. And they actually turned around and brought him back. And I think, and the reason is that um, 
American Christians in particular, you know, certainly and Christians around the world understood what Nazareth was. And so this could not be part of the cleansing operation because it would simply be too obvious. You know, there was, these were people, it would, you know, it, it would, it would put a spotlight onto the certain aspects of, of the Nakba, this cleansing operation. And so Nazareth uh, was one of the places where an Arab population was allowed to remain um, and to this day is still largely an Arab city. Yeah, you know, I, I was just wondering because, you know, I was just about how how a state can be created like that. Like, how does a new country get created in, in these these times, you know? Um, and and I, I was listening to a podcast with uh, an interview with Jeffrey Sachs and he was talking about um, Serbia and Kosovo. Um, and I found that whole thing quite interesting as well. I realized I didn't know much about this. I mean, this happened during my, when I was alive, I was only two years old, maybe <laughs> during the, the Balkans war, but uh, maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. Just because I'm curious from my understanding, um, basically NATO and the West wanted Serbia to, I believe, join NATO. Um, but Serbia was like, now we're not really interested. And then we're like, well, that's not okay. You have to basically do what we want to do. So we bombed Belgrade for like three, two or three months, yeah. um, including the well, Chinese was, embassy, and yeah. then created a, a separate state called Kosovo, where we installed <laughs> the largest NATO base, you know, that in, in Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you were more than two years old. It was, I remember it happening, what, 1999, 1998? Oh, 99, okay. So yeah. 10 years old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it was... Um, yeah, Serbia had already, I think, in part had been broken up, but there was still Serbia and Kosovo. Kosovo is a, 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 it was actually historically a part of Serbia. It's actually, I think, where the, the you know, like uh, um, the historic seat or, or um, um, uh, where the Serbian people, you know, came from where the area from which they originated. Um, but over time, you know, because of the Ottoman invasions, it became Muslim, or largely Muslim, not entirely Muslim, but largely Muslim over time. Um, now, there there had been conflicts that broke out prior to the, you know, the attack on Serbia. Um, and then there were claims, this was under uh, Bill Clinton, that, that in fact the Serbs were committing a genocide against um, the, the Kosovars. Um, now, a, a one person who's done some very good work about it, who actually went uh, to Kosovo, you know, when these claims were being made, was Diana Johnstone, and she's written, uh, I think, a book about it, and uh, and has done written quite a few articles. But she went there, and it just this was not happening. But it, basically, this was the story that was simply fed to the Western press, and she describes how you know this is you know these various NATO representatives or U.S. representatives, you know, in the area were simply, um, you would, would hold press conferences, you know, they, reporters would come from various Western countries and they would be told what was going on and she would go out and actually try to find it and nothing was supported by the statements we were making. But most of these, even back then, you know, most of these, uh, journalists just, um, uh, or were what we call, you know, court scribes. They're simply repeating what the powers would be told them. And so the story, and I can I can remember them, you know, of these stories of, of massacres and, you know, of uh, uh, simply, you know, you know were, were um, very common at the time and it was creating a real hysteria and a pressure to do something about it. So this was one of those first, uh, what you call, well, it was a, uh, liberal interventionism, uh, the right to protect, you know, it was, it was uh, military action that was, uh, uh, you know, based on or, or, or justified in terms of some sort of, of saving a, a local population. Uh, now, you know, again, like subsequent investigations and never, you know, these, these fields that were supposed to be uh, uh, mass burial sites or whatever, they were never found. It never happened. Um, but it was used to justify this two month bombing campaign against Serbia. And it was actually during that two months of bombing, you know, relentless bombing of Serbia that, um, that the Chinese embassy in Belgrade was, um, was destroyed. 
and you know, four embassy members were were killed, and that's something that the Chinese are angry about to this day. Well, well, so if there wasn't a genocide going on, who made up this story and why? Why? What was? Why did they want to bomb Belgrade? What was it? Why, why were they so pissed off at Serbia? Surely there had to be some motive, right? To to create this state of Kosovo, right? Right. Was it, it from my understanding from Jeffrey Sachs? It was just basically because. NATO wanted to to go into Serbia and Serbia wouldn't let it. Um, is yeah, that well? I think that's right. It's just that there was some resistance. One thing is that Serbia has been a historic ally of Russia, and that remains to this day. You can see that Serbia is one of the holdouts in Europe. They, they have not joined the European Union. There's been a lot of pressure, um, but uh, they resisted it. You know, and they have not joined NATO. Um, um, and and you know, at the time. But Kosovo I, you know, is, right? Kosovo was part of... Is part of NATO now. Kosovo... Yeah. There's a NATO base in Kosovo, from my understanding. NATO, I don't know if it's actually a NATO no member. Okay, but they carved sure it off and that, then installed yeah, it. Yeah, there is a large <laughs> just NATO like base. Ukra just no like Ukraine, basically, right. right? That's what we did. Yeah. Same thing. Right. Ukraine didn't want to join NATO. Right. We do a coup. And then we're like, now you guys want to, right? <laughs> right. I think it was just a part, of, you know, part of the effort to to weaken Russia, who is seen as a Russian ally, as a potential, you know, problem state. And it has been a problem state, so-called, you know, recently, you know, when Xi Jinping came to Europe, one of the few places he visited was Serbia. And, mm. uh, you know, this, this ties between Serbia and China were strengthened. Um, of course, that's something that, again, you know, the, the EU, NATO, they're not happy about and it may be you know they even back then there was an awareness that serbia was say again a kind of a um you know I, I, again just a, a one of the countries that was not cooperating in the greater europe project so so was kosovo was it just created uh, became a state because the un drew the lines and said this is it and now it's uh yeah. well the un it was never you know certainly um it was, I don't know that the UN ever recognized it as a state. I mean, it was basically, I think, it's sort of unilaterally by the US, you know, by NATO, by mm -hmm. the Western European countries. Um, and it's, yes, yeah, certainly it was never recognized by, by Russia as an independent state. Or um, China. Yeah, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't actually done, you know, strictly according to the proper UN process. And that's one thing that's, you know, a lot of people pointed out when they say that, like the Russia's annexation of, of uh, Crimea, this is outrageous. This was a violation of international law, and you know, you know, I think you have an argument if you're going to say that 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 may be true, but you can't say that and say that somehow Kosovo was all right because mm -hmm. simply, basically, the West simply broke it apart, took it, and then declared it a country. Um, and it, it was done according to, you know, the, again, according to international law. And, mm. and, uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just realizing, I'm becoming aware that, you know, you know, like things like Kosovo or, or Israel, you know, like you realize that they were created by, you know, the, the, the West for their, its own kind of, its own purposes and reasons. It's not really the will of the people in that area or anything like this, you know, with, Kosovo, it was to, you know, to hurt Russia, to uh, try to punish yeah. Serbia for being supportive right. think, of Russia. You know, probably just, did get a fair amount of support from the people within the Kosovo province, the mm -hmm. Kosovars, you know, I think they did want an independent state. So it's not there they were building it. I mean, of course, in Palestine, you know, there was, it, it was the Jewish population, though it was a minority at the time, they, there was a basis for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make it right. I certainly don't think it was right, but that's, you know, it's not something simply declared from the top. You know, they they, they decided to empower certain forces on the ground. Hey, I think that's what he, how it mm. should be described. Man, there's so much to learn and know about the whole world. Just, <laughs> you know, I nobody's got enough time. You know, I'm just it's just like I'm peeling back layers of the onion. You know, I'm always going back. Yeah. I'm like, you know, and it's. So it's it's been a it's, I mean it's just in doing this podcast so far I feel like I've just been learning so much and going down these different rabbit holes uh, and I don't know where, where they're going to lead I mean the the most incredible rabbit hole that I've gone down just through this podcast with you so far is just is really I can't get over the Israeli lobby and its influence and yeah. the whole state no, it is fascinating it's incredible yeah, no, yeah. 
right. It's he. It's hard to exaggerate. You know, um, it's 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 outrageous, and it's been. Has anybody made a death. great movie about this? Like, it would be oh, so no. interesting. <laughs> oh, I mean, they, yeah, he's all the Jews own Hollywood. Yeah, right. But, yeah, no, I think that's uh, but, but that's, I mean, so hopefully we're going to get. exaggeration, right? <laughs> yeah, but I would say Zionist. But hopefully, you know, you know, more and more, uh, you know, Jews break away from the grip of Zionism and we can start to. Yeah. You know, Again, that's you are the, seeing that apparently in the younger generation. Right. And so that, that could have enormous consequences down the road. Maybe we can make a movie once, uh, this, you know, <laughs> now that we got AI, you know, hopefully we can just do it on, on, on like that Sora AI, just write our whole, whole screenplay and uh, <laughs> we'll worry about that later. Okay. Anyways, I think we're now we're, I'm starting to ramble a bit, so maybe it's good to just stop it here. We're okay. already over and out. Okay, dad. Thanks a lot. All right. No problem.